Good morning. My name's Brad Colburn. Uh, I'm hooked into this church through the Monday night uh, men's Bible study, a life group, and the facilities team. Uh, today I'm going to be reading out of Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, verses 8 through 11. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments to do them, though your, out, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place where I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Good morning, friends. Great to be here with you. My name's Perry. I'm one of the pastors from the Boulder campus. I can't think of a better reason to be here today than to be able to help fill in for Zach while he and Emily are enjoying life together as a young family now with young Everett. I'm sure they're teaching him to walk today or something cool like that. <laughs> It's so great. Last week, Pastor Tom was here from the Boulder campus, and the winds blew him in here um, just because of that severe windstorm and the, the birth of young Everett. It worked out for him to be here last week, and he introduced this new series the book of, out of the book of Nehemiah. And this morning, we'll be in chapter one. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and turn there. I will have many of the verses up on the screen as well. But Nehemiah is found about in the middle of the Old Testament, even though in terms of chronology, it takes place near the very end of the Old Testament in terms of just the time period of history that it covers. But you can find it about in the middle there. There's no shame in using the table of contents as well, if you need that to find it as well. Well, I was thinking this week about how oftentimes my first response is not my best response. I have a life that's full of examples of that, of my first response not being my best one. I can think of a time about 16 years ago, maybe 14 years ago, something like that. I don't remember the particulars of the day. I couldn't tell you what I did, what I ate, what I wore. I couldn't even tell you what time of the, or what time of the week it was. But I remember a particular event from that night. It was my favorite time. It was night-night time. It was the time when I could put one of my children to bed, and in this case, he was probably two at the time, and now he's about 17. And I had him in my left arm, tucked nicely, and you know the drill where if you're a parent, you want to get your child to bed with as few interruptions as possible, so you quietly, you go into the room, and you, you lay your child down in the crib, and then you back away. And you get the door shut and then you go on vacation or you, you, you take a holiday, whatever it is. But instead, this is what happened. The room was dark and it was like I was entering a cave and I made it just a few steps into the doorway when my toes collided with an abandoned, illegally parked toy wagon in the middle of the floor. I won't tell you what went through my mind right away, but actually my reaction had very little to do with thinking at all. Fortunately, I kept Gabe in my arm, snug and safe, but my right arm had all kinds of options in that moment. <laughs> and without thinking, my hand just made a fist and just swung out to the side against the wall. I learned several different things in that moment. First of all, drywall does not hold up well to a concentrated force. <laughs> Second of all, 14 years ago, the internet became a great resource for me to learn about DIY home projects. <laughs> but third of all, while fixing, patching drywall is easy, getting the texture right is not so easy. And so I had this awkward square on my wall that became a conversation piece for years to come. <laughs> but the real lesson I learned was that oftentimes my first response is not my best response. 
Don't we live in a world that forces us to respond and to react to things? Maybe it's the headlines that we see in the media, or it's something on social media. It could just be a careless comment from somebody around us that sets us off. The question is, how do we respond in that way, in that moment that is honoring to God? How do we have a kind of response that is, in fact, our best response? Well, this morning, as we look at Nehemiah 1 and we dig into the story of this man, we're going to see that Nehemiah's first response is his best response. And by looking at what he says and what he does, we can learn more about that for our lives so that when we are in a situation where we need to react, we can also have a response that models the example that he set for us. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Here's how it starts. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Let's stop right there. So we get this very particular information right at the very start. We're told what time of the year it is. This month, Chislev would equate to about mid-November to mid-December on our own calendars. It also says here that it was the 20th year, which is a reference point to the current king of Persia, the king named Artaxerxes. So the 20th year means that this is about 464 AD or so. But the significance of that is that this is 90 years after the exiles were first granted permission to return to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild it. Can I just say, if you feel lost already, I would encourage you to go back, not now, but later on, and listen to Pastor Tom's sermon from last week. That is a lot of background information that will help you figure out what's going on here if you feel a little confused. But the exiles had gone into exile because the Babylonians had gone into Jerusalem to carry them off, to take them out of Jerusalem as part of God's judgment. And then the Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian Empire, and the Persian king at the time, Cyrus, issued a decree that allowed the exiles to return back to Jerusalem. That was 90 years ago, give or take a few years. And so it's 90 years later, and Nehemiah receives this report that the city is lying in ruins still. The walls are torn down. The people are living in trouble and great shame. And the gates are burned down. In the ancient world, a city was a city because it had walls around it to protect it. Jerusalem can't even defend itself. And in a time where you would expect that by now, people would be buying and selling. People would be celebrating and worshiping all that God had done. Instead, the people are living in a state of shame. This is the situation that Nehemiah finds himself in that causes him to react. Look, we might just say, well, that's interesting, but that is so different than any of my circumstances. This is so far removed from my life. But we might just say that Nehemiah finds himself confronted with a world that is not the way it ought to be. Do we know what it's like to live in a world that's not the way it ought to be? Think of the injustice that we see around us. We talk about the 6-8 project coming up. That's all about God's justice. And why do we need God's justice? Because we live in a world that often lacks justice. We're called as his people to bring justice. Think about the the powerful and the rich exploiting the poor and the vulnerable. Think about people who pursue power and retain power at all costs. We too live in a world that is not as it ought to be. So now the question is, how do we respond? Let's look at what Nehemiah does in that kind of moment. It says in verse 4, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept, and I mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
Nehemiah's go-to, his first reaction, his first response is to fast and pray. Fasting and prayer often go together in scripture because fasting is meant to intensify or accelerate our experience of prayer. We deny ourselves food and in some cases drink for a period of time so that we can focus more exclusively in prayer and petition the Lord to act on our behalf. What we see here is that our best response is when our first response is to turn to God in prayer. Our best response is when our first response is to turn to God in prayer. That's what Nehemiah models for us. And if we unpack now the rest of the chapter, we're going to see three different areas of motivation that Nehemiah has that can help us in our own day too. Because this isn't some secret sauce that is just exclusive to Nehemiah, but this is something available to all of us. We can learn from his example so that for us too, our best response can be our first response when we respond in prayer. So let's look at what Nehemiah says. As he prays, this is what he says. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Right away, Nehemiah addresses God as the Lord, which whenever we see it in all capital letters like that, the name behind that is the Hebrew name Yahweh. Yahweh is the name that at that burning bush scene between Moses and God, Moses asked the burning bush, asked God, who should I say sent me back to Egypt? And God reveals himself as I am. I will be who I will be, which is perfectly confusing on the surface. But what God is saying is there, I am the essence, the very center point of all existence. That everything else exists. I am. Even if nothing else existed, God would still exist. And everything that exists owes its existence to God. He is ultimate reality. He is the one that enables everything that we see, everything we hear to exist. He is the Lord. Nehemiah starts his prayer off by just grounding his focus onto that. And then he says next, the God of heaven. God of heaven was a phrase that the Persians had used for their own God. But Nehemiah, by pairing Yahweh, oh Yahweh, God of heaven, is saying, no, the one true God of heaven is Israel's God. It is Yahweh. Heaven is the place where we have the ultimate perspective on this life and this world. Heaven is the place where the problems of this world come into focus. Heaven is the place where the the claims of power are put in their place. And then he's the great and the awesome God. Great and awesome are just two words that are overused in our day, so they really don't have the significance that they should. But Nehemiah is saying that this God is greater than any other thing, greater than any other idea of what God could be, and he is awesome in the sense that there is no other like him. He's a God who, when we come near him, we fall down before him because we cannot handle to be in his presence as we are. So he is the great and awesome God. But not only that, Nehemiah points to the faithfulness of God. He's the God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Nehemiah is pointing to the fact that this God is ultimately trustworthy and faithful. The covenant defined Israel's relationship with God. God revealed himself to them, and then God revealed his will to them, his commandments, his statutes, telling them, this is what it looks like to live in right relationship with me. If you will do this, this is the kind of life and the kind of blessings that you can expect from me. And if you go against my ways and my will, this is what you can expect as well. It will not go well for you. The relationship that Israel has with God is completely predictable. 
They never have to wonder, is God going to have a bad day and just fly off the handle? God has laid out through his covenant what his love looks like. And his love is always loyal to his people. So Nehemiah is looking at these qualities. He's, he's celebrating these attributes of God. And what we really see in this is that the first reason, the first motivation Nehemiah has for turning to God as his first response in prayer is that Nehemiah has great clarity about God's character. Oftentimes, our prayer, prayer life is either strong or weak because of our own clarity or lack of clarity about God's character. If God is the almighty, sovereign king of the universe, then of course we will turn to him in prayer as a first response. But if we don't really know who God is, it's not surprising that we may not think to turn to him first. But Nehemiah has great clarity about God's character. And it's with that clarity that Nehemiah understands his own position before God. He calls himself a servant. This is repeated throughout the passage. Nehemiah is a servant. The people of Israel are your servants. Servants understand and trust that the master is the one who ultimately provides all that they need for life. Nehemiah has that in his mind as he's laying out his requests and then it says that he comes confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. When you come into the presence of God, you're coming before a holy God. God is morally perfect in every way. And for us to come before him, we have to confess our sins because we're entering the presence of a perfect, holy God. Confession can be thought of as like having a bag of stolen goods that we lay out on the table one by one across from the owner. And as we lay each one out on that table, the owner says, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And anything that we keep in that bag is something that we're denying. First John says this way, if we Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But notice what verses 8 and 10 say there. They talk about if, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we say we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. But if we confess, he's faithful and just. This is the God that Nehemiah is coming before. Nehemiah has this great clarity about God's character. Where do we get that kind of clarity from? It's available to us. We find it in the pages of scripture. As we read God's word, as we soak our time and our minds and our energy into understanding this word, we grow in our understanding of who God is. And as we grow in clarity about his character, then our first response can be our best response too by turning to God in prayer when we hear bad news. Nehemiah has this great clarity about God's character, and that's what drives him to pray the way that he does. But a God who can be trusted because his character is what it is, is also a God whose words can be trusted. That's the second thing that Nehemiah shows us here, that when you have clarity about God's character, then you can also have confidence in God's promises. Let's look back at the text. He says, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Nehemiah is quoting from deep in the Old Testament. In our own minds, as we sit here in 2024, we look back on all of this and just kind of blur it together as this is ancient history. But Nehemiah here is quoting from the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And it's just important for us to realize that by the time Nehemiah is quoting these, it's already ancient history. These things were written 800 to 1,000 years before. They're from the pen of Moses. So by Nehemiah's day, Almost a thousand years had already passed since God issued these promises. We might just wonder, do God's promises ever expire? There's another preacher, his name is Vic Pence, and he tells the story of 
buying a blazer, like the jacket, from a major department store from Nordstrom. And he said it's one of those purchases he made where the more, the more he wore it, the less he liked it. And he describes the situation where after wearing it for a while, then he just puts it in his closet because it's just something that he grows to dislike more and more and more. But he says, tucked away in the back of my mind all the while was that famous Nordstrom unconditional return policy. I thought, I've had this thing for a year and a half. I've worn it lots of times, and there's just no way they're going to take it back. But about two weeks ago, I decided I had nothing to lose. I pulled the blazer out, threw a lot of lint on it to make it look really bad, and took it down to Nordstrom's men's department. I walked in, and immediately I felt nervous. It was like I was about to pull a scam of some sort, but I played it straight. I walked right up to the first salesman I saw and gave this little prepared speech. I said, I'm about to put your famous unconditional return policy to its ultimate test. I have here a blazer. I've worn it lots. I've had it for a year and a half. I don't like it. It's the wrong color, and it attracts lint like it's going out of style. But I want to return this blazer for another blazer that I like. And I just waited. I couldn't believe it. The guy with a big handlebar mustache just looked at me and shook his head. He said, for heaven's sake, what took you so long? Let's go find you a blazer. (laughs) 10 minutes later, I walked out with another blazer that was marked $75 more than I paid for the one that I had brought in. It was perfect for me, didn't cost me a penny. God is like Nordstrom. God makes all sort of outlandish promises that we cannot bring ourselves to believe, can we? When we get up enough courage, when we're desperate enough, we finally take him as his word and he looks at us and he shakes his head. He just says, for heaven's sake, what took you so long? God's promises never expire. We can trust him. We can take him at his word. And think about the promises that we have this morning as we sit here in this room. Think about some of the things Jesus said. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Think of what Paul says in Romans, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or think about James saying, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. Or think about Jesus' last words out of the book of Revelation. I am with you always. I am coming soon. These are the promises that we can claim, but we can't claim them if we don't know them. Again, God's word is the place where we discover all that God has promised. And Nehemiah has discovered that God's promises can be trusted in a negative sense. Because Nehemiah has experienced the negative side where God said, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, like the Assyrians, like the Babylonians, like the Persians. If you are unfaithful, I will do that. But Nehemiah knows. He knows that if God is faithful to bring judgment, God can also be faithful to bring about deliverance. That's what this book is all about, the deliverance of God. So Nehemiah trusts that, and God will will return the people back to the land. He will bring them back to the place that he has chosen to make his name dwell there. Where is that place? It's the place where the people are currently living in trouble and shame, where the walls are broken down and the gates are burned. It's in Jerusalem. It takes faith to believe God's promises, doesn't it? Oftentimes when we look around at the circumstances in our life and in the world around us, it can be hard to believe that God's promises can be trusted. But we see here from Nehemiah's example that we can trust it. Nehemiah's best response was his first response because he turned to God in prayer. He had clarity about God's character And he had confidence in God's promises. But that's not all. I told you there were three things about Nehemiah that helped him pray first. The third is what we find in verse 11. 
Nehemiah says this, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Notice the kind of desperation that Nehemiah prays with. Lord, would you hear this? Would you give success to your servant today? Would you grant me mercy in the sight of this man? Back in verse 1, we learned that Nehemiah was in Susa, the citadel. Susa is the capital of the Persian Empire. And in Susa, that is the place where the Persian kings would spend the winter months. So it's in Susa where Nehemiah it finds himself, a place of great comfort. Nehemiah is in a place where his own personal needs are taken care of. And unlike Jerusalem, a place that's unprotected, Susa is a place of great protection. Susa is a place where Nehemiah can enjoy his life, but yet he's not satisfied by the material comforts that he experiences there. When he hears this news about what's happening to his people and what's happening in the city of Jerusalem, he cares enough to still react in the way that he does. But Susa is this place where the Persian kings are because Nehemiah is around the Persian kings. What we see is the third reason why Nehemiah is able to respond the way he does is quite simply because Nehemiah, because he trusts God's character, because he believes in the promises, he also has the kind of courage to risk his own life according to God's purposes. He's willing to risk his own life because he has that kind of courage in this faithful God. What does that mean? Well, as the cupbearer, Nehemiah is a guy who has unprecedented access to the Persian king. Nehemiah is a man whose job was just to, to taste the food, to sample the wine, to make sure it's okay to drink, okay to consume. But more than that, Nehemiah is on the inner circle of trust around King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah has this access that few others can enjoy. But as he does that, Nehemiah is forced into a dilemma. But think about just the Old Testament in, in a bigger picture form of different places where God has done similar things in the lives of other people too. Think of Joseph, who sold into slavery by his brothers who were jealous of him. But he ends up being second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. Think about Moses, who's born into an Israelite family, but is raised in Pharaoh's household and then leads the people of Israel out of slavery. Think about more contemporary to these kinds of events here. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who end up being advisors to the Babylonian kings. And then more current with these events with Nehemiah, there's the likes of Ezra, Zerubbabel, Esther, God knows how to put his people into positions of influence to impact the lives of others and to accomplish his purposes. I wonder, I wonder maybe where God has put some of us in this room this morning. What kind of a risk he might want us to take in according with his own purposes. See, in each one of these circumstances, everybody I just mentioned had to take some great risk they had to lay their life on the line in one way or another in order to accomplish God's purposes or to see God work through them. So what is it with Nehemiah? What's the risk he's taking? The whole report that Nehemiah receives early on in the chapter is due in part to his boss's decision. Ezra chapter 4 tells us about this time during King Artaxerxes' reign when Artaxerxes hears about this opposition that's going on in and around Jerusalem and he is convinced by people who live there who do not want the Israelites to rebuild and resettle. He's convinced by them to issue a commandment, a decree that the work be stopped in rebuilding the city. 
So Artaxerxes is the man who is officially responsible for the condition that Jerusalem finds itself in right now. And that is the man Nehemiah works for. Nehemiah has to lay his own life on the line. He has to exhibit great courage in order to be a part of God's solution to accomplish God's purposes. Nothing will accelerate and invigorate our prayer life quite like entering into the arena ourselves. Quite like when we move from praying for other people, which is important, to praying for ourselves because we are willing to step out and take a risk ourselves. A risk that requires great courage. But it's a risk that we find the courage to take because we have, again, that clarity about God's character, that we know his promises can be trusted. But it's that kind of arrangement where we we trust his character, we know his promises, and where we exhibit that courage that invites us to have our best response become our first response because we reach out to God in prayer first. My friends, I don't know exactly what this might look like in your situation right now. I don't know what kind of struggle you might be facing, what kind of call that you might be facing that you have to respond to. But I do know that your best response and my best response can be our first response when we turn to God in prayer. May we have the courage and the confidence to be able to do that, even as we go out out from this place this morning.